everybody for participating in our luncheon today. Our talk today is on Innovative Pro Bono, which our speaker is Je Jessica March, who is the Legal uh, Program Manager for Southeast Asia, Australia, and the Pacific for Trust Law, which is um, an, uh, an NGO associated with um, Thomas Browder Foundation. And today she will talk about pro bono, how to do it sustainably, and why why do you need to do pro bono works? And Jessica has experience in corporate legal practices as well as nonprofit and social enterprise. So please welcome Jessica. Hello. Hi everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. So, uh, yeah, as mentioned, um, my name is Jessica Marsh. I work for the Thompson Reuters Foundation. Um, the Thompson Reuters Foundation is uh, the charity arm of the global Thompson Reuters business. Uh, so the business you may be familiar with is um, business products, legal products. Uh, we have the Reuters Newswire, um, that's a global news service. So our charity uh, foundation programs are broadly aligned. We're quite separate, but the activities are broadly aligned. So we have uh, media and uh, news and information services under the charity, under the foundation. So we, we train journalists around the world. Um, we support uh, freedom of the press and run editorial uh, services. So most recently, Myanmar Now is a news service in Myanmar that was covering the elections and other issues. So that's uh, a service under the foundation. Um, we have an editorial team that covers underreported stories. Most of them are ex Reuters journalists. So they're, they're producing journalism of very high quality, but covering stories that maybe don't get enough airtime. So some of the stories they cover are climate change, um, human trafficking, uh, land rights issues, uh, and many other uh, human rights and environmental uh, issues. Um, we have a global conference every year, the Trust Women Conference, which looks at uh, women's empowerment and also increasingly there's a focus on um, anti-human trafficking, anti-modern day slavery. So that's happening this year in London, uh, bringing together government, private sector, NGO, um, uh, representatives at a high level to talk about these issues and have uh, actions going forward coming out of that conference. And finally, um, Trust Law, which is the legal program that I work on. Uh, so I'm based here in Bangkok and I cover um, Southeast Asia, Australia and the Pacific with the Trust Law program. And what Trust Law does is uh, connects NGOs and social enterprises with free legal assistance around the world. So we have a network of NGOs and social enterprises that have been vetted. Um, we make sure they're good organizations that are doing what they say they're doing. And we have a network of law firms and in-house corporate counsel that provide free services to those NGO and social enterprise clients. So we have a presence now in 170 countries. It's a truly global program from the inception of Trust Law in 2010. We have now grown. Um, we have over 3,000 members. Um, part of the aim of Trust Law and part of my mission is to, to spread the practice of pro bono, so to try to get more lawyers around the world uh, doing pro bono, understanding the value of doing pro bono um, and supporting them to do that. So there are some jurisdictions around the world where pro bono is institutionalized. There might be government targets to, for lawyers to do certain amounts of hours of pro bono. South Africa, Australia, the UK and the US are the, the leaders in that sense. Um, so what we're aiming to do is also go to jurisdictions where that's not happening yet and try to have more uh, more program support happening. So we just had our first connection in Bhutan. Um, we had our first member in Alaska, so really global. And more and more, we're working with uh, corporate council um, in-house teams from big corporations. So the types of legal support that Trust Law uh, provides. So, um, Corporate commercial uh, advice that, that NGOs and social enterprises might need in their day-to-day -day, um, operations, so intellectual property, tax, employment, um, lots of other uh, legal questions that corporate firms and corporate counsel are, are very well placed to assist on. And also strategic uh, research, so right beyond environmental issues, 
uh, might be on human rights issues, where we have law firms around the world who are doing research on the law uh, that can then inform um, policy advocacy or it can inform um, some of the programming work of NGOs uh, working on these issues. <coughs> This is an example of a few of the, the research reports that Trust Law and our, our law firm partners and NGO clients have produced. So um, on the left is Defense Handbook for Journalists and Bloggers. And so that was um, for Reporters Without Borders, um, looking at the laws around the world that journalists need to be aware of uh, to ensure that they're not uh, in, in danger or that they're not breaching the law. Um, in the center, um, Justice What Justice, uh, that was on um, survivors of acid attacks and the law that applies to them. And on the right is crowdfunding for social ventures. So that's a legal resource that uh, supports social enterprise and social ventures who are looking to crowdfund um, for, for their operations. So it's a very broad, that's a few examples, but it's a, a very broad uh, range of legal research that we can support on. So, Part of what trust law does, and in order to spread the practice of pro bono and to try and um, uh, make this a, a movement, I guess, uh, we, we have a, an annual index of pro bono. We ask law firms to submit their data on what they're doing, um, how they're doing it, how many hours, how many of their lawyers are doing pro bono. Um, so the, the 2016 index was just launched on the 27th of July. That's available on our website if anyone's interested. Um, and some of the key findings there there was over 2.5 million hours of pro bono done in the respondent <coughs> law firms. Um, lawyers on average taking on 39.2 hours of pro bono per year. So the legal sector, I think, um, is it's, it's a, a historically entrenched uh, practice in many jurisdictions. Lawyers feel they have a duty to um, provide free legal services to people who can't afford it or to organizations that might not be able to afford good services. Um, it's part of, I guess, as a lawyer, you have a commitment to access to justice. So you have a duty to use those skills to contribute back to the community. So we see a, an amazing uh, commitment from lawyers doing this, and, and we want to see more. So that's why we're we're measuring it. And the index is a good tool, I guess, for um, law firms that might be starting up in new jurisdictions that might be interested to know how to do pro bono or look at benchmarks in different countries of what the average is. Um, in Australia, there's an aspirational pro bono target that the government has set, um, which means there's a lot of pro bono activity in Australia because the government has set that target. If you want to be a law firm um, on the government's legal panel, uh, you have to show them that you are doing pro bono. So for that reason, we see a lot of, a lot of pro bono happening in Australia. We look at a dialogue with government as well and bar councils in different countries to say maybe you might want to set an aspirational target to encourage more pro bono happening. We've seen an increase, increase across Asia Pacific. Um, so Indonesia, Philippines, South Korea and Vietnam have aspirational pro bono targets, normally through the, the local legal association, the Law Society, the Bar Council. Um, and it's likely that other countries will follow. Not on this slide, but one of the key findings this year was that the pro bono is only up um, in a big way in China. So we saw a lot more lawyers in China undertaking pro bono. At the same time, there's a new NGO law in China that regulates foreign NGOs, which make, makes it much harder for them to operate there. So we're seeing kind of, I guess, an interesting uh, dynamic where there is a need for pro bono services in China and lawyers are doing it, but there's some challenges in the, the policy frameworks there. Another big trend this year was uh, there was a big increase in um, refugee and immigration pro bono work. So we saw over 40% of the respondent firms around the world um, making refugee work as, as a key area for them. And that is very likely in correlation with the EU refugee crisis. So a lot of firms across Europe are looking at that and, and contributing their time to that, that crisis. So, but that should say council, <laughs> corporate council. So a lot of our members, and increasingly so, we have in-house uh, lawyers. So many of the Fortune 500 companies and the majority of Fortune 100 companies have set up or are moving to set up pro bono practices. So they, most of those companies will have global CSI strategies and policies where they are you know, encouraging all of their staff to be involved in that in some way. 
and more and more, and we're also encouraging those who haven't thought of how their lawyers, but the pro bono practice of their, their lawyers in house is part of their CSR strategy, and potentially a very big, in, high impact part of their strategy. So, some of our most active members are some of our corporate counsel teams, and one of the benefits of working with corporate counsel as well is they often have offices in countries where law firms may not have a presence, so uh, they, they often have a bigger reach than some of the international law firms that we work with. Um, so to, in January, we had 44 in-house legal teams, mostly global corporations, so that means hundreds of lawyers around the world for each of those teams. Um, and what we do often with, with our corporate counsel <coughs> is um, we found that uh, one strategy from trust law's perspective to make it a really effective um, uh, strategy and a really sustainable strategy is to, to partner our corporate counsel teams with law firms. So often corporate counsel aren't insured to give external legal advice, so we partner them with a law firm that they might work with anyway. Um, and that law firm extends their insurance to the corporate team um, and they work together on the pro bono project. Our, our law firms really love this because it's usually a client of theirs, the, the client's corporate counsel team that they can work with outside of their usual day-to-day -day work. And, and our corporate counsel teams really like this too because normally in-house lawyers work in small teams. They might not have a lot of people to help out. So when they partner with a law firm, it means they can share their resources and work together on, on pro bono projects. So the business case for pro bono. One question I get all the time, uh, especially in context where pro bono is not done very often, is so I have Thai lawyers asking me all the time here, why do lawyers do pro bono? It's you know we we need we have targets we have we have to make money we have targets for fee fee paying clients we don't have time for this and, and why do we why would, why do lawyers in other parts of the world do hundreds of hours? Um, which is a really valid question and I think it goes to the <coughs> how you make pro bono sustainable inside a company or a law firm as well. So we often talk about the, the business case for pro bono. So some of the, the benefits that a business or a law firm might uh, derive, might, might gain from doing pro bono. It provides interesting opportunities for their lawyers. There is research to say that um, some of the big international firms, particularly where there's a comp very competitive job market, if you have a solid pro bono program, that means your lawyers can do interesting work outside of their daily corporate commercial work, which they might love, but sometimes it's nice to have a break from looking at contracts. Um, then that really helps with staff retention at, at the firms. There's pretty solid evidence about that. It can <coughs> inside-outside relationships, so working with your corporate counsel client is a really good um, selling point. It can enhance their professional skills. Often we have teams of junior lawyers working on pro bono projects, so they get to do FaceTime with a client or a client without the risk of losing a multi-million dollar um, file, potentially. They still do a good job, but you know it's, it's a good training experience for the junior lawyers. CSR is often a big part of the CSR strategy. You're looking holistically about what the company is doing, <coughs> being a responsible corporate entity, um, how you look at how you interact with the community in a legal way is also a big part of that, and how you can contribute. Global network, so 170 countries, we have lawyers around the world doing this work, we have NGOs around the world, so it's a really great opportunity to meet um, and be connected to interesting people around the world doing really interesting things to change the way where the way the law works, to change environmental, you know, progress environmental issues, um, improve society, so that's a, a good part of the, the case for pro bono. So then the next two points relate very much to that. Um, we see increasingly competition from our legal teams, so the big international firms and corporates that have solid pro bono practices are now competing for pro bono work. So we identify really interesting projects for them, and we might get, recently actually we had a project in India which was a uh, trafficking legislation project. They're looking at introducing a new bill. An NGO is introducing that bill. They wanted lawyers to help with the drafting of it. It was quite an urgent request. We put the, the request out to our network on Monday. Within half a day, we had 10 law firms respond for that. So that was a really, I mean, that's a testament to the strength of the trust law network in India. Our team there does a great job, but we 
will see more and more corporate firms really competing for this work that they think is going to be high profile, high impact, and have a really positive impact on the societies that they live in. Sometimes we have to gently let law firms down and tell, tell them why they can't do the work for free for some of our clients. That can be a tricky conversation sometimes. So how do you make pro bono in a company or in a law firm sustainable? Um, uh, the Australian Pro Bono Centre recently released Best Practice in Pro Bono, which lists 10 key points for doing pro bono sustainably. So I won't go through all of them. I, I, I know I've breached the walls of PowerPoint here by putting so much text on one PowerPoint. But um, basically the, the key points, if you want to have, and, and this would apply to other non-legal um, corporate volunteering as well, if you want to have a sustainable corporate volunteering or pro bono uh, program, you really need to have support from the top. Um, you need to have awareness across the firm, so buy-in from lawyers. You need to have, um, so management support is really the key initially. You can't have your managers say, why are you spending two hours working on another file when you need to be spending time on this file that makes us money? So that, that's probably the number one. Um, law firms that count the pro bono hours in the same way as they would count um, Fee-paying hours is really key, so that the lawyers uh, doing pro bono, those hours would count towards their KPIs each year. So strong, so performance of pro bono legal work to the same standard as commercial work. So we don't like, often you'll see um, lawyers maybe not prioritizing pro bono work over fee-paying work, and of course they have to prioritize, but we, we don't like them to see that going to the bottom of the pile and pushing it back and having to wait hours and few days or weeks. So um, we really demand that it's a professional service as well. So I won't go into any more on that, but um, I think if anyone's looking at you know corporate counsel or in-house corporate volunteering, uh, it's, it's a pretty good resource on, on how that might be done. So pro bono and sustainability. Um, uh, I guess being here at Sasson and, and me trying to grapple with what sustainability means, I know it can mean a lot of different things and, and it's quite broad. Um, I suppose one of the recent projects we have is um, that, that, that links very much with some of the work that's done here and some of the thinking. Um, so this year we have the Trust Law Awards where we recognise good pro bono projects every year. And this year one of our nominees for the Lawyer of the Year is a lawyer from Australia. We have lawyers around the world who are nominated, um, with DLA Piper of Australia. And she, she worked on a project for Business for Social Responsibility, BSR, which I imagine a lot of people in the room might be familiar with that organisation. It's a global non-profit. And the project was advising on climate change negotiations. So the lawyer sat down with BSR. BSR had seven core proposals that they wanted to include in the Paris Agreement. Um, so in December 2015, the COP21 um, sessions in Paris, the lawyers sat down and said, how do we draft uh, the wording that you want included in the agreement and how do we negotiate this? And sort of gave them some training on negotiation and, and on alternative wording for what should be included in there. Um, and from that, I think they were able to have all of their seven proposals, I think, uh, included in the, the final COP21 Paris Agreement, which was a really great result for them. And they've nominated Joanna from DLA Piper for the award this year. They talked, this is a quote from, from the client, who was very happy with the, the legal service. So they were totally invested in this project and shared the vision of success and pushed for outcomes that we cared for. This made the relationship less transactional and far more collaborative. I believe this contributed greatly to our shared success. So they never made us feel like clients, but rather as true partners in co-creation and impact. And I think that's a really amazing demonstration of the power of pro bono. And when you have lawyers or other professionals coming on board and taking seriously what some of the non-profit clients are doing and partnering with them and not just treating it like piece of paper, then they can have really amazing outcomes. And that's increasingly the kind of pro bono work that we see our, our top legal teams and top corporate teams, they're looking for this kind of work. They want this kind of opportunity for their lawyers to contribute and to make a big change. So I know I'm not sure if there are any lawyers in the room. I know this has been quite focused on legal, legal issues, but there are a few other um, 
uh, well, quite a lot of other opportunities for corporates, executives, professionals to do work um, similarly to pro bono legal work. So corporate volunteering, using your expertise and your skills to support uh, non-profits, social enterprise, uh, individuals who might need that support. So a couple of organisations are um, Taproot Foundation, which um, they look at pro bono in other sectors, not the legal sector, so I think they look at finance, uh, marketing, and a few other areas. Talent Trust, which is an organisation in Singapore that uh, brings on board professionals um, from business, uh, from the private sector, and partners them with NGOs to mentor them. So they provide their expertise, they look at organisational governance, structuring, management, all of those skills that people in the business sector obviously can offer. So there's a lot of opportunities, and I think the legal pro bono world, had this is, it's got a long history, it's very well developed. I think other sectors where they're looking at this kind of thing have a lot to learn from the legal world, and I'm not just saying that because I'm a lawyer, but I think there's a really great tradition and um, there, there's a lot of great institutionalization of, of pro bono law firms and corporate um, firms, so it would be great to see more of that happening in the same way in, in other industries as well. So just to, to finish, um, there's a couple of short two-minute videos which are the Trust Law Awards 2015. So these were award-winning projects uh, that were awarded last year and they demonstrate um, really great pro bono projects that, that were part of the Trust Law Network. Um, they're fairly self-explanatory, so I'll, I'll just play them now. Successful lawyers are very busy people. They never get enough time. They neglect their families, they eat unhealthy diets, they don't sleep enough, and so why on earth should they give time to pro bono? But they do. Well, we've been doing pro bono since the firm was founded. Mr. White and Mr. Pace did pro bono. They set the tone for the rest of the firm, for the rest of its history. The matters that we get through trust law are so relevant to what's going on today. We've done gun control matters. We've done LGBT rights matters, like human trafficking matters. This is what you see in the news. White & Case has been one of the most supportive uh, law firms of all since day one. They have taken more than 100 cases since the creation of trust law five years ago. And they have taken big programs that, you know, are cross borders, uh, are incredibly costly for a law firm, but also incredibly valuable because they can have an impact. Lawyers have a privileged position in society. There are many things that people and companies can't do without it, but many people and many NGOs cannot afford good human services. If we can get more pro bono support, then it means that we don't spend money on it, and it means that we can spend more of our resources on the good stuff. <laughs> I'm doing the good work for the people with dementia and their cares. Working with White Case on our project was fantastic. Uh, Marina, the associate in charge, was so responsive. She wasn't looking to just take the box and get the project done. I think one of the most memorable <coughs> projects that we've worked on is for the <coughs> in the Philippines. It was a global research project on the right of domestic workers. We were able to contribute to the law actually being changed in the Philippines to be a stronger protection for domestic workers. It is very important to have a legal context. You need the government to institutionalize it. And the only way to institutionalize is through law. And they need lawyers who can speak in the language of those who ensure large scale social change. So my case for the first firm to agree to get my data from all of their offices for the trust law index pro bono. Not only that, but they were always there to help me understand how best to define and structure the project. And they were advocating on our behalf to throw their whole support behind the initiative to make sure that it's a long-term success. Trust law has been evolving very, very fast. And I always need also partners to help me think of the future and see further what we can do next. And trust law has been just a great partner for us, not just in finding matters, which is key, but more and more over time as a thought partner in where pro bono is going, how to get other offices and regions involved in pro bono, where there hasn't been a tradition of doing pro bono. It doesn't take a lot of time. It does have a lot of impact. It affects the reputation of the firm. And you can, not to be corny, just change the world a little bit, and you'll feel a better human being. Um, this 
final video is uh, one of our in-house teams working with one of our, our law firm partners. Our seniors recognise that we've got unique skills as always so we can contribute to our communities and we're very much actively encouraged to do so. In Kenya, my colleague Nathan worked on a project for water sanitation for the urban poor and it really hit home that one because he recalls his grandmother having to carry water from a well um, from far away for miles and um, water sanitation is a huge issue for him. My name is Jack O'Regan and I'm the Smart Life General Manager. We're providing high quality and affordable drinking water. The goal is to use that as the core product, as the hook as it were, in developing that healthy living brand. Nutrition, hand washing, sanitation. City Group provided us with the opportunity to be able to assist them with registering a trademark for the term Smart Life. We work together instructing with local council, providing the advice and actually seeing a fairly good end result for the client. On all of the projects that we worked with City Group, the city individuals have been dedicated and enthusiastic. They take a very hands-on approach. In terms of the free media day part, it actually just frees up a lot of our time. And we're able to spend more time actually in the store, training staff, so that's all benefits the local community. But it isn't just the pro bono, it's good quality service. It's good information, it's professional, everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. So very efficient, professional, and uh, enjoying it and uh, straight forward. I think uh, I seem to have turned on the auto, um, the automatic uh, transcription service at the bottom which had a few typos, I'm not sure how that happened. Um, so that's it <coughs> for me. Um, I welcome any questions if you're interested to know more about uh, Trust Law and what we do, uh, or Progrono in general.
So some of them are, are, are much more than others. It might be four hours average per fee earner at Ashhurst China. Um, but so that, that average per fee earner, 39, I think it would be, I should double check that, but that's a good question. Do you have more questions? Thank you, Jessica. So, uh, so who, who's eligible to receive a pro bono award? What, what are the criteria? Sure, yeah, we have, um, on our website is the vetting criteria, but I can go through that just briefly. Um, so we work, we work with NGO clients and social enterprise clients, and also referral partners. So the, the NGO clients, uh, we require them to be legally registered as an entity somewhere in the world. So if it's a US registered uh, NGO, um, 501 3C organization in the US that wants to start operations in Thailand, we could assist them to set up here. Um, there just needs to, needs to be a legal entity that is the client. Um, we need to see that they have their, their uh, financially sustainable, so we wouldn't normally work with someone who's just started last week. We need to know that they have a track record and that they're sustainable before we ask our lawyers to contribute valuable time to, to work with them. Um, for social enterprises, it becomes a little, we, we do a lot of vetting, or more vetting for social enterprises because, you know, they're a sort of a spectrum. There might be non-profit or for-profit. We do work with for-profit social enterprises, but we look to see that they're reinvesting 51% of their, so the majority of their profits back into the social mission. That could mean a whole lot of things. Reinvesting into your social mission might be expanding, it might be um, paying your staff a decent wage, which they've been working for peanuts for three years. So um, we don't go to that level of depth, but we look at, do they have their social mission locked <coughs> into their constituent documents? Do they have a public statement of what they're doing? If they eventually start making a lot of money, what happens with that money? If, if they're, you know, we don't, I think for-profit social enterprises are a great thing, and if they're making a lot of money, that's wonderful, but they can then afford to pay for their legal services once they get to that point, if they're not reinvesting. So we've been, it's all available on the website. Um, yeah. Thank you. Questions? Lawyer alert. <laughs> no, 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 not a lawyer, but law school dean alert. Um, I'm just curious, uh, in, in the way the presentation, the thinking, but this reflects uh, a personal uh, bias. Um, starting in the late 1970s, lawyers in the United States uh, decided they were no longer a profession, they were a business. And the case you made was a business case. What has been bothering me for a long time is that when lawyers give up the, the definition of professional, it, it does trigger many issues of sort of ethics, commitment to society, and the old structure of a lawyer is the officer of the court, which nobody talks about anymore. The entire heritage of the law in the Anglo-American tradition is when you swear an oath to be a lawyer, to be admitted to the bar, you become an officer of the court, which means to some extent you are a public official. You have responsibilities to enhance and protect the rule of law. And I rarely hear that talked about, except occasional oath timers and a few judges. Yeah. It just seems to me that the legal profession and is should get back to a fundamental moral sense of, of what it owes to society. Because if they are not standing up for the rule of law, and all they care about is making money, then, then they, it's sort of a slippery slope. And we end up with characters like Bill Clinton, who argues that, well, it all depends on what the meaning of is is. And, and, and at the time of his impeachment, we had the word evolved called the lawyer, which is very negative to write for a term. Because what lawyers do is lawyer. They, they don't actually help society or help the truth or anything. So I'm just, I'm just sort of, this is a creed occur actually. And if you're with Thompson Reuters, I know all the guys in Westlaw in the old days in St. Paul, but if you really want to do something, if you could take your, your, your trust and try to reestablish a sense of idealism among the profession, that every lawyer owes something to, to have society to live up to the highest ideals of justice and law. So thank you for listening to me. No, I <laughs> I'm guilty of skewing this presentation a bit given the audience today. I think I was uh, I was advised it should be relevant to business and corporations. So, um, and often actually, I, I mean, I entirely agree with that. And I think we, we, we do try to remember the core of why people do pro bono. Pro bono is for the public good. Lawyers have a duty to um, 
to use their skills for the public good, uh, to they have a, should have a commitment to access to justice uh, and having positive change in society. Absolutely, that is the core of trust law. It may not have come across so strongly there, but I think one of the arguments or some of the arguments that tend to have the most traction when we're in markets that don't really get pro bono, aren't very enthusiastic about it, or also with corporates that have to speak in business terms, sometimes that argument gets a little bit of traction, but <coughs> definitely we can't, we can't forget the other part of the, uh, the core of what, what pro bono is about. So for, for example, I mean, just reflecting on what you're thinking about and a lot of right. stuff, many of the issues in corporate social responsibility revolve around duties, duties of the entity, duties of the board of directors in particular, and they tend to look to lawyers to limit and shrink down the nature of their duties. If the lawyers had, in addition to client service, uh, some way of outreach, of pro bono outreach, as to what is the purpose and mission of the corporate entity or the private entity, if lawyers had a sense of outreach around fiduciary duties for, for anybody in business, uh, this would be in the nature of creating culture change on the business side. So you're not just, again, making a business case about this, but you're actually using the vision of the law and justice to go to people in business and say, we can help you conduct your business in a more responsible way. So, I mean, lawyers are not bad. Well, we have a joke, and you know, you know the joke in Minnesota, right? Okay, that, that uh, in Minnesota, lawyers are always buried six feet lower than everybody else. <laughs> You know why? Deep down, lawyers are not too bad. <laughs> I, I, just quickly to respond to that, um, the, yeah, I think business and human rights is an area that law firms should pay more attention to. So, as law firms, you need to pay attention to your your own supply chains, your own staff, your own mission, what your what clients you're taking on, how that impacts everyone. So we're, I'm actually going to be on a panel on business and human rights and pro bono uh, in a couple of weeks in Bali, and we're talking about balancing where you have a client that maybe isn't there's some ethical issues there with what they're doing commercially, and at the same time you have a robust pro bono program and you're working with NGOs that are trying to do environmentally. Uh, you know, sustainable things or, or you know or human rights work. If there's a tension between your corporate clients and your pro bono work, what happens there? And I mean we, we have NGOs coming to us and saying all your all your members are big law firms and corporates. We're you know we're working in land rights and resources at the grassroots level. How can you guarantee to us there's no conflict of interest in, in the law firms that are going to give us free services? And it's it's you know it's an interesting question and it ties into very much what you're saying. More questions? Thank you, Jessica. Um, could you just share with us a little bit of how the, uh, if you will, sort of the work gets divided? For example, if the trust takes on a case and identifies lawyers, are you, is it the, is it, uh, the burden of the law firm or corporate to pay all the expenses that these lawyers have to fly to Kenya, say, to do the work? Or does the trust cover some of that? And or what does this mean, say, for lawyers in smaller firms? Sure. So we wouldn't. Um, the the services are completely free. We never put any uh, burden onto the client, the NGO client, unless there's disbursements like paying the registration fee for your trademark registration, that kind of thing, will fall on the client, as it does in other uh, cases. The lawyers donate their time for free, but they won't cover the other costs. In terms of flying to Kenya, we actually wouldn't. We wouldn't normally require that. That would be the law firm going above and beyond if they wanted to do that. But we have a network of law firms across the world, so we would connect that question with the law firm that's based in that jurisdiction, or an international firm that has offices across the relevant jurisdictions. Or sometimes we have teams of different law firms. If we have a cross-jurisdictional research project across 10 jurisdictions, we might have one international firm take on a coordinating role, and then five domestic firms in, in, in those countries that the law firm doesn't have a presence. So, um, it's all done for free. Um, trust law, our role is facilitating that, we connect them. For the bigger research projects, we play kind of a project management role, but in terms of the money, there, there's no expenses. I mean, it's the, the time of the lawyers that's the um, that's what's given. So, yeah, there's no costs usually involved. We sometimes, as the foundation, we put resources behind publishing um, valuable research resources, put it on our website. If it's newsworthy, our, our journalists will put it out to the newswire, um, and we'll sometimes put resources behind launch events and, and things like that to get the information and the resources out there. Um, 
But apart from that, it's, it's really just time that's donated. Anybody else? No? Okay, before we leave today, could you tell us if there are some organization that no get qualified for services? How do they go on about requesting for Yeah, services? sure. So, I mean, uh, they can contact me if, they, if they're in this region um, and I can talk to them directly. Uh, there's a lot of information on the website. You can click through, um, I'll show you actually, if you can click through to the application um, form and so there's the application form for um, for membership on the website that has the vetting criteria there. It's an online application, and once that comes through, uh, one of our members of our team will look at it and check that they meet our vetting criteria, uh, and then the regional person will be put in contact to talk further about any specific legal needs or research that they might need. So um, yeah, feel free to contact me and refer any if you know any organisations or law firms that might be interested, I'd be very happy to talk to them directly in, in this region, or I can put them in touch with our colleagues in other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.